Today, we've got somebody on the show who manages over $250 million of yearly revenue on Amazon. He's got tons of strategy golden nuggets he's going to share today about product launch, keyword research, PPC, and more. How cool is that? Pretty cool, I think. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Serious Sellers Podcast by Helium 10. My name is Bradley Sutton, and this is the show that's a completely BS-free, unscripted, and unrehearsed organic conversation about serious strategies for serious sellers of any level in the Amazon or Walmart world. And we've got a super serious seller here today. Like, he does some ridiculous, ridiculous numbers here. Uh, he's known to tell a joke or two every now and then, so he's not too serious. But uh, Matt, welcome to the show. How's it going? Good, good. Thanks for having me. All right. Now you just like blew everybody's minds uh, a few weeks ago at the Helium 10 Elite Workshop. We're not going to get like, you know, try and rehash that. Some of that stuff is 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 behind the paywall there because it's just too hot for for, for podcasts here. But I, I want to we're definitely going to talk some some advanced strategies that you use. But but before we get into that, l let's set the stage here because, you know, you're not uh, somebody who, you know, goes on every single podcast out there. It took me like a year to even book you on on this. And, you know, we don't see you on stage at every single event. Usually you, you just do the high end mastermind uh, out there. So there's a lot of people who might not like know your, your, your name, like a Kevin King or something. So let's talk about your, your credentials. But I want to take it before you're even Amazon career. Like, I know you're in Colorado now, but were you born and raised in, in California? Uh, no, actually born and raised uh, just outside of Columbus, Ohio. Okay. All right. And then graduation of high school, did you go to uh, the Ohio State or <laughs> did you stay around there or what? No, I, I was going to, but just too close to home. It was about 10, 15 minutes away and needed to get a little bit further away. So went up north um, to Kent State. It's about two and a half hours away from Columbus. Um, and then after Kent that, State, yeah, that's where um, oh, there was a famous, I think the Antonio Gates went to Kent State. Uh, I think a, a football player from the Chargers uh, went there. He was, he was like a football, or he was a basketball player at Kent State, and then he he, he changed to football. Anyways, I always little, know random sports things uh, about there. So what was your major over there? Uh, it was architecture, actually. So I, I did uh, hmm. architecture for three years and kind of realized I didn't want to design commercial buildings for the rest of my life um, about three years in and ended up just majoring in accounting. Okay. All right. And then did you get, you actually get a, a degree uh, in it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and then so, did, you, did you get into that um, after no, graduation? No, so actually um, about my end of my sophomore year of college, um, started noticing how much I could resell textbooks on Amazon for. Um, so started basically mass mailing all of my classes um, at the end of each semester that we would buy their books back for $5 over the spot price that the bookstore was and everyone sold their books to us instantly. And we turned around and flipped them. Um, so went ahead and basically kind of parlayed that out into multiple different universities kind of in our tri-state region while I was in college and started applying to jobs when I graduated. And I was like, man, I'm already making like three times what they're offering me selling books on Amazon. Wow. Might as well uh, figure out what this is. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So you just started that is just like a regular seller seller account and and just putting them up as, as used and, and just making bank over these rich college kids. Exactly. Interesting. So then at what point were you like, you know what, I, I don't want to just be flipping college books, you know, for the rest of my life. Uh, what else can Amazon do for me? Yeah, so it, it actually took a little bit of time for me. Um, so I, I moved to California right after graduating, um, settled in Manhattan Beach in L.A., and basically got into retail arbitrage at scale. So um, had deals with local stores like Big Lots, Target, Walmart, um, and I would go in and buy out everything they had um, at the end of each quarter and did that for four to five years, basically, just um, made a pretty good living, um, continued to do that. And then started what, what was some of your peak sales like during those four to five years, like over the year, like your gross revenue, like some people don't understand how much potential there is in, in retail arbitrage back in the day. I mean, even still there, there's some potential, but, uh, back in the day it was kind of crazy. I'm just curious what your numbers were. Yeah. Uh, back then we used to be able to do about two and a half to three and a half million a year, uh, with just two people. It's there's some serious wow. volume in it. The the big issue is the the margins are very tight because you're always battling for the buy box. Other retail arbors would get it from other targets or whatever, and then you you'd lose all of your profit. So, I mean, very very thin. Um, but yeah, made a great living for multiple years. Wow, that, that's pretty cool. So you would like, did you have a truck and then you just go and load it up, or was this in like vans or how how did you manage that? 
Yeah, so it was actually rented U-Hauls. Um, so whenever huh. we had a, a big enough load, we were renting U-Hauls, pick it up palletized, and they would drop it right in the back for us. And was this like cash or would you pay credit card? Uh, we were paying credit card. So we were, it was all going through the POS system at the local retailer. So oh cra- crazy ass credit card points. I've got millions and millions of miles still from that. <laughs> you, you wouldn't have had to like, you didn't have to like stay in the regular line with, with like 17 shopping carts. So you had like a special checkout or something. <laughs> yeah. So the, the way that they would do it is they would um, basically the manager would come and override it and they would bulk scan one thing and just override the entire order. Yeah. Is this, is something like that doable today? Do you think like 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 could I here in 2022 go to uh, you know there's there's a big lots here there's a Burlington Coat Factory there's these different places and like maybe you know see if I can negotiate some kind of deal like that with or is this kind of like only viable back in the old days? No, it, it is definitely still viable. Like we we just moved to Denver from uh, Vegas a few months ago. Our entire garage was full of retail arbitrage stuff that I was still buying. Like, yeah, it never wow. like gets out of your blood. You're at Target. You're like, man, I can make thirty bucks on this. I'm going to buy all forty yeah. of them that they have, and off they go. Wow. Did you ever get into like baseball cards and stuff? That was a big thing at Target for a while. Uh, and I tried to get into it. Like, I would have to go there like on the day that it opens. But you could like buy if you can get in on some of these things. You can get it like twenty five dollars and sell it for like one hundred fifty bucks on not on Amazon, but uh, but on eBay. So I never got into baseball cards. My big one was actually uh, limited edition Nintendo um, DSs and 3DSs. So um, they have like the Zelda edition ones, Mario. Um, you could basically buy them. You could sell them instantly and make a 30, 40% um, margin on it. But if you held them for anywhere from a year and a half to two years, you could three to four extra money. Did you ever go into your own private label you know i obviously i know you know fast forward that, that you work for tons of brands uh out there um but but what about for yourself yep um so after that um kind of saw where that whole retail arbitrage was going got out of it um still obviously dabble in it but uh went into some supplements and, and personal care products i i really didn't want to compete with a lot of the the black hats which there weren't as many back then in supplements i mean there, there were still some but um, we kind of went the route of patenting a lot of our stuff. So, uh, we actually bought some patents from some people and redid their kind of older products and then relaunched them back on Amazon. Made, made in USA. Yep. Made in the USA. What, what year about, what was it when you first got into it? Um, that would have been 2015. Okay. So, so still early on in the, in, in the Amazon game, you know, not even many tools, if, if any, you know, around that time. Um, and so 2015, 2000 to 2017, like, d- did you surpass ever uh, your private label business on its own? Did it ever surpass that two or 3 million that you were doing before in the, in retail arbitrage? No. So it, it never actually did, um, until here mm-hmm. recently. Um, but the margins were just so much better and personal care, like our kind of model behind what I launch is, we don't want sexy products. We don't want to be the most searched thing. I want items that will sell 20 to 30 units a day and I make 40 to 50% margins on them. Um, so we look for ugly products, like products that you'd be embarrassed <laughs> to buy at Target. That's what I want to sell you online. <laughs> I love it. It's a great product research uh, uh, tip right there. And then, then you don't have to worry about fighting um, fighting a bunch of black hattery out there. Okay. All right. So um, now, you know, fast forward you know, now we're in 2022, like what, what do you do nowadays? And like, what's some like crazy numbers that you can throw out uh, of what you manage and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, for the last four years, um, we've been running a agency. So I lead our kind of Amazon e-commerce division, uh, at right side up. We focus on really anything, any type of, uh, paid performance as well as like, uh, OTT podcasts, really all advertising, um, but we do offer full service management from operations to ad spend, to outside traffic, to launching, like whatever you need done, we do it on the Amazon side. Um, to date, we're averaging about $250 million a year in managed ad spend. Um, our average account does anywhere from about 25 to $30 million a year. I uh, work with a lot of big brands that you probably have in your house, as well as people that are just starting out, may have some PE funding and just trying to get things going. Okay, cool. So obviously, you know, you know what you're talking about. You've done it yourself. You you do it for other people. So l- let's start just talking some 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 strategies here. So what's uh, what's one of the unique things that you think you know that you do that maybe others might not know about or might not do much that that really helps you you know stay a step ahead of the competition because you know uh, you personally might pick unsexy 
uh, products, but you know, a lot of your clients, you know, so some of, some of them have to compete in some of these sexy categories. So what are some things that you're doing to, to, to kind of stay ahead of the, the, co- the stiff competition out there? Yeah, I, I would say the, the biggest thing that we really do that, I mean, honestly, hasn't really started happening for the last few or four, like five to six months, people have started to do this a bit more, but outside traffic. So mm-hmm. if you come to us and you're going into a keto snack category, like we're engaging not only our Amazon team, we're, we're getting you podcast placements. We're doing Google ads. We're doing Facebook ads. We're, you know what? We're doing Let's everything. go ahead and pause on that because yeah. you mentioned that about three minutes ago and I, I, you could have mentioned it in that elite workshop, but you know, I have a... Uh, I'm like that guy from 50 First Dates. Uh, I forgot who, who, 10 Second Tom or whatever his name was, who would just forget things. So I, I might have missed it, but I haven't never heard of somebody talking about promoting Amazon products on podcasts. So, so can you talk a little bit about that strategy? Yeah. Um, so we actually started doing this for the first time about three years ago. Um, started on a, a dog treat brand company um, back when you could still technically kind of do search find buys and everything was kosher. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, we would run ads on uh, podcasts, uh, send them to a landing page and basically give them their coupon code there and have them go search for the item on Amazon. Um, was very, very effective, way cheaper than actually running any other type of ad for us during that period. Podcast ads have gone up tremendously, though. It's it's gotten a lot more expensive. Um, so we do focus on very specific podcasts that are very niche down to certain brands. Um but still an amazing way to launch a lot of times too. Like what you'll find is someone will search like Joe Rogan supplement, which that's a huge search term on Amazon anyways, because of on it and everything else. And if you can get enough correlation between your product and that keyword, you're going to rank for every search term that starts with Joe Rogan. Uh, Obviously, you know, Lego, you know, they use helium 10 and Procter and Gamble use, you know, there's some huge companies who can just throw ridiculous money uh, at any point, you know, they probably could, you know, uh, uh, advertise on Joe Rogan podcast, but, but, but the average seller, you know, obviously it's not going to try and go to Joe Rogan po- podcast though. So what are some number one ways to, to kind of look for a smaller podcast that's relevant to your niche? And then, you know, I have no, I have no idea. Like how, how much would it cost? You know, like for, it, it, can you say like, Oh, if they have this many listeners, you can, you can count on a mention costing this much. Can you talk just a little bit about that kind of stuff? Yeah. So that, that's definitely kind of where it's a mystery. Um, so we, we know a lot of this data because we're, I think actually we're the largest buyer of podcast media now as an agency in the U S. Um, so we have all the back data on like what's performing and how it works, but there is no way to really look for these databases outside of just manually searching and trying to find ones within your niche. Um, we actually kind of stumbled upon podcast in general, um, by accident, we were actually sponsoring YouTube, uh, videos for uh, dog training for the original pet food company. And we found it and we found out about a month and a half in, um, we just got this huge spike in traffic and couldn't figure it out. YouTube video wasn't getting views and they, they had published a podcast and actually talked about us on that. And that's what took us down this whole route. So what we usually recommend for people with lower budgets is find those influencers on YouTube that are in your niche. And I mean, like, really, it doesn't matter how many subscribers they have, as long as they're getting 10 to 15,000 views um, on their videos, that's what we look for. And then a lot of times you'll find out people in these niches have their own podcast, they've got vlogs, they've got everything else going on. And they, they really don't know their worth. So you can buy a lot of these people very cheaply or even just offer them a commission on the sales and it may not even be any cost besides free product and that commission from what they can produce. So then you can almost just say, hey, like, here's a link and you make it an attribution link and and say, you know, I'll give you 15 percent commission on sales, knowing that you're going to get that 10 percent back from the what's it called? The um, the. Um, Oh, the brand referral bonus. Yep. Brand referral bonus. And then, so you're really only paying 5% commission. So like that would be one of the strategies that you would use. And, and then is it kind of just like, Hey, this is kind of the honor system because you can't really give somebody a link to the, the, um, the attribution. Like I, I just, I actually, now I just thought of something, you know, Helium 10 just came out with the attribution tool where we can create attribution. I just literally never thought about this until this conversation, but uh, on certain levels of Helium 10 accounts, you can have sub accounts 
And then so I can make a sub account for an influencer in Helium 10 and they give them only access to, to attribution. And then they could like in real time see the clicks and purchases or something. But anyway, I'm just thinking out loud here. But but is that kind of like how, how, how you do it? Or? Yeah, so the way we do it, um, a lot of them actually are, are very trusting. And so like we, we screen share live whenever we're reporting back earnings and we show them that like we're not fudging the numbers in any way whatsoever. Yeah. Um, but we do short link them with, um, like bitly links or, or something along those lines. Doesn't mm-hmm. matter really what you use and you can create sub users on that. So they can at least see the clicks and the traction that it's getting yeah. whenever they'd like. Um, and then you share over the Amazon one, which it is off by like five to 15%, give or take from what we've seen, but, yeah. uh, not off by too much. Okay. Interesting. All right. So there's, there's one thing, you know, I don't think we've ever talked about here on this uh, podcast is, is podcast uh, advertising for Amazon products. Uh, go ahead and continue from, from where you're talking, some of the other unique things that you guys are doing. Yeah. Um, really the, I think the bigger thing that we're doing that I don't see many people talk about on Amazon. Um, as far as I know, there's only one software out there that does this, but we launch everything based on LTV value and not actual, like what's our cost per individual sale. Um, so Right off the bat, like we do a lot of replenishables, like fast moving CPG products are our bread and butter at our agency. Um, but this works with everything that we've tried it on. If you're thinking long term instead of short term profits on Amazon, you're always going to come out ahead. And really, the, the big thing is if you're selling a supplement, for example, like on my own personal supplements, we're willing to go three to four orders in the whole per acquisition because we know our average customer buys about seven times once we get them. So we're spending three to four X on the same terms that everyone else is. And you're just going to win. On all of these that, you know, can be putting continuity, you know, uh, you know, the Amazon way of that is, is subscribe and save. Uh, are you do, you do you pretty much recommend like, hey, if you've got a supplement, if you've got a beauty product, if you've got, um, you know, something to do with pets that, that, that needs to be replenished, 10 times out of 10, always activate subscribe and save on your offer. Or are there any cases where you're like, nah, nah, don't don't do subscribe and save? Nope. Always activate and always okay. fund 10 percent. We even like yeah. um, we have some supplements and you may see this if you're searching where people like combine three or four bottles together or whatever. They'll have a one bottle variation, a mm-hmm. two bottle, three bottle. We never do any of that because you actually want the individual sales volume through individual units. Uh, um, when you're splitting it up against ASINs like that, we don't see you get as much of a keyword lift as a whole on sales. So most of our supplements, we like the third or fourth image. It's like buy two, save an extra 10 percent on top of the subscribe and say buy three, save an extra 15 percent and so on. Okay, that make that makes sense. Um, are are you doing any kind of like inserts or things to kind of be able to start building a list with so, some of your customers that you're doing? And, and then if so, what is your strategy? Is it like in your follow up where you say, "Hey, uh, you know, here, here th- thank you for purchasing this, leave a review," but also, um, or or maybe not asking for a review, but you're, you're saying, "Hey, to, to activate your your lifetime warranty, you know, click this." Or do you have an insert card that says that? Or you know, I would imagine the supplement space uh, or beauty space or a replenishment replenishable space like this is even more important than, than other niches. Yep. Um, so we do it on everything. Um, any client that comes to us that doesn't have it, we either redo their packaging or figure out some way to get an insert into it. A lot of them, um, they may just be doing supplement bottles and like we we're really against throwing something on the outside of the packaging, like a QR code or anything like that. So for um we actually just started doing this on a supplement company about a month ago. We're putting um, NFCs behind the labels. So when you get your phone close to it, it automatically pops up with a link um, to click through. How, how would they know to, to do that, though? Um, so we have a we have a thing that says basically it's a little image that says, like, place your phone here. Um, but oh, okay, people, okay. people at the Amazon warehouse aren't going to be having their phones out. They, they take those as soon as you check in at Amazon. Ah. So it's not something they're going to be looking for. Aha. I like that. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. And then now, you know, you, you've built up, do you wait until you get to a certain number before you start leveraging this? Or do you only leverage this list when you have a, uh, you know, a new product you want to launch or how do you leverage this, this buyer list? And, and first of all, what, what, what's your, like your, your, your percentage of how many people you actually get to, to opt into that? Yeah. Um, recently it's, it's actually been dropping. We're getting anywhere from like 12 to 15%. We used to get a 
pretty high rate, like 25 to 30, but we were offering like deep discounts on kind of that next order. Um, but what we're doing, and this goes back to that LTV, is we're putting everyone that comes through, we're obviously getting their order number when they go ahead and do do whatever they're doing from that insert, and we put it into our database. We're then looking at that product, say you bought a green tea pill from us or whatever, we're looking at what is the average reorder time period window of someone who purchased that product. So for that one, we know it's like day 27 through day 35. You're going to start getting emails or texts from us on day 27. Um, and then we kind of follow more of a traditional e-commerce strategy where we're, we're using Klaviyo to message these people and keep that relationship going. Do you Are you sending them back to Amazon then to purchase or do you send them to Shopify or, or where do you send them to? Yeah, so this always actually comes up a lot with our clients. Um, we always refer to Amazon. It's a search arbitrage channel. It's not going to generate like for your brand. It's not going to really do anything beyond arbitraging what's already there. Uh, and we want to obviously own the customer as much as possible. So once we do get an email address, uh, we go ahead and actually send them that first email and give them the option of either buying the item on our website or buying on Amazon. Whatever they click in that first email, um, that is what they get tagged as in Klaviyo or whichever email provider we're using at that point. And from that point forward, they only ever get Amazon directed emails. If they chose our site, they only get our own direct site. And that way we're removing as much friction as possible. And I mean, we've A-B tested this a lot. We've tried where we've only sent to the website for the first couple of emails and then switched to Amazon. And really just giving them the choice at the beginning works extremely well. Um, what we do do is... For most of our items, like when you get that email, though, we'll say like save 50% on our website, save 30% on Amazon just to help incentivize that push over to our site. And honestly, like half the time they still end up on Amazon, even with a lesser mm -hmm. coupon. Hmm. Now, you know, I, I don't know too much about brand referral bonus other than, you know, the basics, but like. What if I in one of these emails, what if I put one of those attribution links? Will I get the brand referral bonus or that's this is only if the traffic actually comes from one of these approved um, social media channels? Uh, no, so you, you'll still get the, the bonus. So so do you do, do do you give them attribution links then? We do. Yep. So we have attribution well, I, links I, I, on everything. That's crazy. Why, why, why isn't everybody doing this? Like on their fault? I didn't even know that. I, uh, like you, you, if you guys, if you're not using attribution, you're leaving literally 10% uh, on the table. Like I, I thought it only had to be like, you know, coming from a certain, you know, like a Google or, or Instagram or something like that. No, we use it for everything. Like if we're promoting blogs, anything like that, where they do expire though. So we, that's why we always use a URL shortener so we can change them out um, and rotate yeah, them through yeah. or switch the product later on. But any influencer we're using, any YouTube video we're sponsoring, it's all these types of links. All right, guys, you, you heard it like, you know, I know a lot of you aren't using it yet, but even the platinum members have access to Amazon attribution now in Helium 10. So if you guys are doing follow up uh, on your own with your customers and you're not giving them this link, you are literally leaving uh, money on the table. Now, um, what you know, what is uh, let's just talk about launch, you know, mm -hmm. obviously, if you're an established supplement brand and you've got your big audience, you know, you, you can you can do some marketing there when you launch. So let's we'll talk about that. But let's first talk about like somebody is a new seller, you know, I've got, I've got a decent amount of money. You know, I'm not just some, you know, I only have a $5,000 budget for my first product and marketing, you know, you know kind of person, but you know, I, 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 I want to, you know, be able to make a splash. What is your current launch strategy now that you, like, like you said, you know, last year or the year before, I forgot when, um, you know, search, find, buy kind of, uh, you know, is, is against terms of service now, you know, two-step URLs, et cetera. What's your launch strategy for brand new to Amazon brands? Yeah. Um, so what we're doing right now, um, if you're 100 percent brand new, uh, what we recommend, we've actually had a couple that we've had to do this on. We create a fake product and we sell it for a couple weeks. Um, mm -hmm. But you what you want is that search query performance report. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. If no one if you aren't using this, go to your brand Alex and please check it out because it gives you everything yep. you'd ever yep. want to know about any keyword and the organic traffic and sales that it's getting. Um, so we use that data exclusively, um, as well as data that we pull from Helium 10 kind of to overlay since we don't know the ad sales that come through on that data. Um, mm -hmm. But what it allows you to do is you can basically figure out the units that anyone is moving because you can cross reference the search query performance reports, your brand analytics report for any keyword yep. and know exactly how many units the top three are doing. So mm -hmm. we work all of that backwards um, and then hey, it's next 10 to 15 days, we need to hit these sales goals for these keywords. Um, you can do that in 
dozens of different ways. Um, right now, the, the main way that we're doing it is through Google Ads um, with high clippable coupons on the items um, when we're starting and running Amazon ads, specifically exact match campaigns and uh, product targeting campaigns on basically the top three for all the keywords that we want to go for. So we'll go back and pull the brand analytics data weekly for our keyword list. And then we make sure that we're targeting all of those three ASINs that appear in that brand analytics all the way back for the last year. And are you, are you running like sponsor display, sponsor brand, uh, sponsor product ads all from day one? Or are you waiting a little bit at all? Yeah, so uh, day one, the only thing that we are launching is sponsored product ads. We will basically run an exact match campaign if there's a ton of search. Like, say you're going after Keto Snacks. Keto Snack gets ridiculous search volume. We'll put that off in its own campaign so that's not stealing the volume from everything else in there. But usually if they all get like around 10 to 15,000 searches, you can throw five to 10 keywords in one campaign and not have any issues with that. Yeah. And then we're creating a second campaign that is also a sponsored product campaign, but we're targeting uh, products, not keywords. And that's where we're dumping those in. We let that run usually for the entire launch, um, 25, 30 days. We do not bring in any other type of ad until that period is over. Now, when uh, going back to the Google ads, uh, are, are you doing canonical URLs or, or, you know, how, how, how is your Google ads actually helping your Amazon SEO? Yeah. So, um, when you're running Google ads, whatever keywords you're running them for, that obviously gets triggered over to Amazon. You'll even, you'll see it in the URL. So you're, you're getting basically a boost for those keywords. Um, but I think the thing that we do that other people don't do is you go straight from, hey, um, on Helium 10 for the keto category, keto snacks is my number one keyword, uh, low carb snacks is my number two. Google yeah. search is not the same. Those aren't going to be the top search terms most of the time on Google because it's not a buyer intent kind of um, yeah, search platform. Yeah, makes sense. So we're cross-referencing through SEMrush. Um, what we're doing is we're pulling the top three sellers for where we want to be and taking their canonical URL, throwing it in SEMrush and seeing organically where their Amazon listing is for each of those keywords. And then okay. we're pulling whatever those top traffic keywords are that the number one search result is Amazon. And we're running our ads right above that. We've seen that it works better because usually it'll be ad from Amazon, ad from us, and then the organic Amazon listing is all people will see and Google, and they're going to click one of those Amazon listings. Interesting, interesting. And then, so so basically, you're putting a, just a regular attribution link in there, but the fact that they're clicking that link from a Google search, Amazon is picking up on that on that original search term from Google. Yep. Interesting. I see. I didn't. I didn't realize that. And on the now on the attribution link, there. If you are using a shortener for it, um, are you still getting like like the attribution and the the key or or like key, let's say there's a you know uh, in my in my personal experience sometimes your canonical your regular canonical URL, which is why I always suggest like hey guys try and lock in your canonical with the five keywords or, or tell Amazon like hey can you change my canonical to this because because mm -hmm. whenever I have big sales days you know my keywords and my canonical will, will increase but if you're using a shortener for your attribution link that that will will you still get the rank juice from what your canonical has or do you lose some of that yeah so we don't use shorteners um, when we're running Google Ads but um, uh, we, we have okay. done it in the past we don't do it anymore as long as you don't check on the whatever shortener you're using to hide like yeah. the pixels and cookies you're fine it, it will still transfer over um, okay. but a lot of times some of those actually have that defaulted on and people don't realize it Okay, so the key is uh, if you're using a shortener, don't have the uh, don't don't block the uh, the pixel. Yeah, because okay, if you're interesting. if you're used to using any of the Amazon ones, they all automatically block that because you you don't want like if you're using some of the the famous two step URL creators or things like that, yeah. they all block where it's coming from. Interesting. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll have to make sure Helium Ten doesn't doesn't have that. We also have a sh a shortener too because the the reason why we did that was. Um, we can have stats like from day one, like in, in, in real time. Like I think an attribution, if you just do it there, you have to wait until 15 clicks or like a week or something like that to actually see some data. But, but when we use the helium 10 one, it's like somebody clicks on it. I know 10 seconds later, I'll be able to see it on the dashboard. Okay. So, so that's a uh, new, new brand new to Amazon for launch. Let's say this is now my third or fourth product. I've, I've got a list, uh, you know, of, of customers. Do you take some, 
uh, some effort then and just focus on your your existing list uh, of people who are already uh, you know proven to buy from your brand to launch? Uh, it, it depends. Um, so I'd say on about half of them, yeah, we, we would send out very targeted emails. Uh, we, we use Klaviyo for all of our email marketing um, and you can segment out like crazy there. So we look and basically poll who's been buying on Amazon, like if it is a supplement product, have they bought the last three to four months from me multiple times? And then we'll slowly put them into different kind of nurturing campaigns that trigger every two to three days and slowly boost that out. Um, we also have some triggers that we've set up in there where, say, um, Klaviyo actually integrates with Amazon directly, um, pulls all your orders and things like that through. If we haven't hit a certain number of orders per day for that product, it'll actually go ahead and send an email again to like 20, 30 people and check every 15 minutes. If the orders haven't gone up, it keeps sending those emails until we hit our daily quota. Because what we've seen is even if you aren't getting your targeted sales per keyword per day, as long as you're keeping that volume moving, even if there's not a keyword behind that sale, um, it, even if it's just a direct link to the canonical, you're still going to continue to move up the ranks. It's really more about keeping your velocity up day over day versus making sure you get your sales per each keyword per day. All right. Now, you know, l l like you said, you, you onboard a lot of people who have are already established on Amazon. So I'm just curious, you know, when, when you take a look under the hood at maybe some other PPC strategies, what's some of the most common mistakes that you see? You're like, oh man, I can't believe these guys are doing this. You guys are leaving so much money or you guys are wasting so much money. Like what, what do you see as the common PPC mistakes that, that people new to you guys are doing? Yeah, I would say every large account, and these are accounts doing over 10, 15 million a year. The biggest mistake is they are not using negative match keywords ever. It doesn't even matter if they had a, a large agency wow. um, running it. Cause what, what we've seen is, most of these big brands like PNG, they have like agencies of record that they work with and you have to be one of those agencies of record or that brand manager can't come and work with you. And it's a very long process to kind of get that moving. So there's a lot of legacy agencies that have this that say they do Amazon ads or something and they have no idea what they're doing. They're just taking what works in Google and trying to bring hmm. it over to Amazon. Um, so that's shocking to me. Like I, but it's, it's hard to believe that no, <laughs> there's people out there who thinks you can get by without using, but we're not even talking about newbies. We're talking about established, you know, $10 million companies are doing that crazy. What else? Yeah. Uh, the, the next biggest thing that we really see is no one's using sponsored display. Um, everyone has a bad experience. Like I hated sponsored display up until about a year and a half ago, the changes mm -hmm. that they've made in the targeting. And then even here recently, like, I mean, it competes with DSP basically at this point wow. that they're, I think they're trying to make a self-serve DSP um, channel, but for a lot of our clients, it's actually the highest returning uh, ad spend we spend is on sponsored display. Yeah, I, 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 on one of our weekly buzz recently, we we, we um, broke the or not we didn't break the news. I mean, Amazon broke the news, but we, we mentioned how now on spot if I'm not mistaken on sponsor display, you can put a lifestyle image and like a logo. Uh, like, have you guys started playing around with this, this this new stuff? And like, what's your what's your strategy going to be there? Yeah, so we do a lot here, actually. Um, we actually use your your partner um, company, Pactia, to manage all of our ads yeah. for our agency. Um, we're split testing on all of our sponsor display, four to five creatives per um, ad type. Um, but what we're doing that I think a lot of agencies are starting to catch up now and do this is we have very specific images and headlines for certain keywords. So if you're in that keto snack kind of category and you're searching low carb, our image is going to be a, something along the lines of low carb. Our call out is going to be low carb. And then if you're searching keto snack, you're never, ever going to see those low carb call outs. We're going to go back to switching and using whatever main keyword that you're huh. using. Um, and we, we basically, we have a team overseas that does this in bulk for us. So everything's kind of laid out in a spreadsheet and they're just matching headlines into images. Sometimes you can get away with putting that in. Um, sometimes it gets caught by Amazon flagged and they won't let you do it. Um, but the headline is always um, on target for that specific search term. Okay. Now you mentioned PacView. Now that's one of the Helium 10 companies there. So like me, myself, I'm not actually too familiar. I've never used PacView for any of my accounts. Um, I'm not, you know, I consider myself not big enough yet to, to need it. But what, you know, so, so some other bigger customers out there, you know, seven, eight, nine figure sellers out there, like why would you suggest to them to use PacView? Like I don't know too much about the feature. So like what's your favorite features of it? Yeah, I would say our biggest um, feature with PacView, they actually just released their commerce center, which is 
I mean, kind of, I, I think Helium 10 might have like lended them some data there because there's definitely <laughs> some mixing going on. It's showing a lot of your organic sales, um, just really anything that you want to see about the product, about your competition and how it's kind of running. But really the granularity that you can get with PackView, like all of our accounts run on custom roles that we're setting up specific for each of those accounts. Um, but the, the biggest one that we've actually been using here a lot is they have one where it's basically search impressions based on your um, organic rankings. So once we have an mm. established product, um, PackView actually pulls the data on where you're ranking organically for all of those keywords. I, I'm I think it's every hour. I'm not sure exactly. Mm -hmm. But if you're ranking in the top three organically, we can pause out our ads. We can decrease our bids 90 percent, whatever we want to do while that top three is there. And then as soon as that top three ranking is gone organically, it'll instantly turn our ads back on and we're running again mm -hmm. for that keyword. So we play a lot of that kind of flywheel where we're, we're riding it to get the rank up and then we're pulling it back seeing how much organic sales we can get and then riding it back up again and constantly kind of going up and down. What about for the average seller? Uh, what's your favorite Helium 10 tool? Like, you know, for you, you've been probably using it for years. Mine is Cerebro. Usually I find Cerebro is for others too. How, how about you? Yep, Cerebro. We use Cerebro daily. Um, everyone on my team uses it nonstop. Um, I, I think the, the biggest thing that we use it for is we love Helium 10's keyword tracker. Um, by far mm -hmm. the best, usually the most accurate from what we've seen. But we actually pull Cerebro's at least once a week um, and we're checking all of the like top 20 items that go against our our product uh, yeah. because most people I don't think even look at this when you actually download the Cerebro report it has everyone's keyword rankings off yep. to the right hand yep. side so we plot that out and we keep track of it to see if there's any movers or groovers in the category interesting okay that's, that's a good strategy now speaking of strategy we, we do something on this show we call that the TST or 30 second tip so you've been giving us you know strategies throughout this whole episode but maybe you can give one or two that you know you don't have to stick to 30 seconds but 30 second to a minute like some quick hitting things that, that you think uh, can give some people some easy wins uh, in Amazon I would say probably our biggest thing here recently and, and this is every client that we bring on it's something that we do as soon as we bring them on the first month really optimize your image stack um, so we pull everyone's questions and answers. And we make sure if there are questions that are coming up on every competitor's product, we answer that in our first two to three images. Because I don't know about you, but I only shop Amazon on mobile. I never scroll down to the bullet points or the A plus content on mobile. I swipe the first three to four images. If it doesn't yeah. say what I want to see, I'm on to the next product. Yep. Um, yep. Doing that alone has doubled our conversion rate on a lot of products. So it doesn't take much time to do. Helium 10 actually scrapes it. That's where we're getting all the questions and answers from and super simple. Excellent. All right. Now, what about a non Amazon tactic? Like, like, uh, like, I don't know if you, you help customers who, who want to sell on Walmart. Do you have any Walmart strategies or Shopify uh, strategy or something else? Yeah. So we, we do basically every marketplace at this point, um, for Walmart, it's honestly, um, kind of like where Amazon was six, seven years ago, you you can get away with a lot of things that you can't on Amazon. Um, Two-step yep. URLs still work perfectly fine. You can rank a product to the top of any page with just add to carts. You don't actually even need purchases. Um, but the biggest thing that I think people miss out on is Walmart will actually upload, if you're a new seller, say you've been selling on Amazon or Shopify, your reviews to your product on Walmart. Um, all you have to do is open up a support case with their team and basically prove that the reviews are on your Shopify site and they'll port them over. Um, most of our clients are like, well, we don't have that many reviews on our Shopify site. So we use Helium 10's extension to go ahead and scrape those reviews. And then we post them ourselves to our Shopify site. And then we get Walmart to syndicate them up to the products. Super cool. Super cool. All right. Well, I really appreciate you coming on here. I'm sure people might have more questions or might even want to hit you up to, to check on how they can procure you for their, uh, you know, your services for them. Um, how can they find you on the interwebs out there? Yeah. Um, so they can go to rightsideup.com. Um, they can email me directly at matt at rightsideup.com or growth at rightsideup.com. Awesome. All right, Matt, thank you so much for joining us and hope to see you again soon. <laughs>